Well, good morning, Southside Bible Church. <clears throat> Just a couple of announcements I wanted to share with you as we begin. Uh, yesterday we had the memorial service uh, for Joe Beck. That's Russ's mother and Flora and uh, just good to have the family. Are there, are there any of them here? I think. Oh, oh no, we got Ben. Ben waved to everybody, man. Ben was a big part of the start of Southside at its beginning, and he used to work with our youth. Any youth here that actually were taught by him and Mark? Raise your hands. Hey, they still exist. <laughs> so the bottom line is don't let him teach your children. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's a bunch of them hanging around. They just wouldn't put their hands up. So good to have you with us, Ben. We, we love you, our dear brother. And then I uh, wanted to share with you a, a dear brother and sister in our church got hit with a hard providence this week. Uh, John Jackson and his wife, Kim, his son of 31 years, um, had a deep battle with alcoholism. And uh, John couldn't get a hold of them, so he, he called, and they weren't answering, and he flew out to California, and when he got there, his son had passed away at 31 years old, and it's just, um, it's been a hard providence, but John, his faith in Christ, even all the people who were with him, the emergency workers were just looking, saying, we've never seen anyone respond like this, and his faith and trust was beautiful in Romans 8, 28 and all that we've been journeying, the foundation of his heart. And so I want to use this of, to let you know anyone battling and struggling in silence with any sin, any, any depressions and all the things that we journey on the way to glory, that uh, it's, it's in community that we help each other get to glory. And, and if we isolate, there's, there's a true danger in it. And so John wanted me to share that and encourage uh, anyone with that. And then uh, John and Kim, can you just raise your hand so everyone knows who you are? So um, be praying for the memorial service in January. A lot of people will hear the gospel. And then I want you to be praying for them as our calling as we get to help this brother and sister journey. And so I just have such a respect and love for John. It's been a joy. God kind of gave us a close brotherhood right out of the gate. So, some people call him the Ed McMahon of Christianity. He, he laughs at everything I say. And that's got to be a spiritual gift. And so I, I, knew you, I knew you'd be here just smiling like you always do, but we love you and we hurt with you. And it, I just want you to know that, that we'll journey with you guys. I just want to pray. Father, I lift up John and Kim. God, I pray that you comfort them as you have been in Christ. They have labored through trials, hardships for decades, seeking your face to know and love you and trust you. And now on one of the hardest providences they've ever faced, it's landed on faith, hope, and trust. And so God, that's to your glory. No human being can do that. And so we thank you for that. And we pray, Lord, in the seasons when our brother needs to weep, Lord, that we'll be there and we'll help him and Kim journey this season and really his whole family and all that they're feeling during this time. God, we thank you for the life of Joe Beck. I thank you uh, for her home going and just for the roars and the way they put you on display and nurturing her for all these days. God, thank you. I, I ask restore their health and, and, and all that they gave of themselves to help bring Joe, to usher her to your finish line. So thank you for bringing her home safe. And just thank you for, for that dear family. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I'm going to continue with bad news is we're not going to be in Romans this morning. We're going to start back up in Romans in 2022. Um, there, there's just these five unanswerable questions now to finish the chapter. And what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. And so if I did one today and then did... Christmas and New Year's and all of that, it just it wouldn't be right. So we are breaking from Romans this morning. <clears throat> but I'll give you a long introduction in the New Year, and I, I, might, I might even pull the chain out for you guys again. So let me just give you a lay of the land for the next few weeks. This morning, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 9, if you want to turn to that even now. Uh, next week, 
we're going to look at the gospel, and then Christmas Eve, we're going to look at John 1.14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's more of a, a devotional. It's just staring at the gospel. And so just uh, encouraging you to get out and invite friends, families, everyone to hear why Jesus Christ came into this world. Uh, highways and byways, go out, bring people in. Be diligent in this. Let's go tell it on the mountain. Do the work of an evangelist. So let's look then at this bright hope when we celebrate its fulfillment this Christmas uh, that tends to, to deepen uh, just at this time. It seems to exalt darkness in many people, and we have the, the answer, the light of the world. So let's, let's pray. Um, let me read Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, and we will open it up. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, and there'll be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this prophecy. God, I thank you 700 years before Christ enters the world, Isaiah, being led by the Spirit of God, is declaring to us what's coming into this world. And so I thank you for this, and I pray now that you will meet us as we open up this word. Holy Spirit, teach us from our mind to our hearts. Change our lives. Let us get this. And I just pray, shed light into every darkness this morning. Amen. So the diamond of what I just read, uh, sometimes to see the fullness and the beauty of something, the, you know, like when you look at a diamond on black velvet, it, it shows its brilliance. And the context I want to set, because I think it just shows the brilliance of the diamond of Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. And so my prayer and hope for everyone this morning is that you would see the glory of Jesus Christ with the eyes of your heart that every one of you through this word would, would see it and behold it. And I want to set the stage for an amazing promise that is given then in these verses. So let's take a look at the context of our passage. Uh, verse 22, it's really that of darkness. Uh, Isaiah 8, 22. <clears throat> then they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they'll be driven away into darkness. And so gloom, anguish, distress, darkness, there's just a great despair filling the land. The world is in chaos and turmoil, and if I could use a phrase to describe it, it'd be there's no light. They can't see, they don't understand, they're just walking around in, in darkness, they're, they're hopeless. They're, there's no hope in the world, the absent, without God, no hope and darkness. And they've turned away from God, and the earth they're looking to the earth for hope and help. And even they're looking, and we're going to see in our passage, to the demonic world. And it's left them void and empty. You turn from God and you look to this world and the demons of this world, and you're going to be empty. They can't find a remedy. Though they're groping like a man in the darkness, mankind doesn't hold the key for their problem. They need help from outside of themselves much like today, we just see the earth groping in darkness and no hope all around us. They're trying to figure out the answer and everything you read or see, it's just garbage. It won't work. It's not helping. We're a land in darkness. It's not going to be hard to fit this context this morning. In the midst of this, Isaiah speaks a prophecy from God of a great hope of how to bring light into your darkness that God would send the light of the world <coughs> to bring salvation from sin and darkness. And the news was announced here, and, and it's the best news. And I just, I don't know about you, I love good news. And because there's a, there's a power to news. And a while back, I shared a story with you about uh, the power of news, and I want to do it again. Near the end of the Second World War, true story, Behind the enemy lines in Nazi Germany, there were prison camps. In these camps, American soldiers were kept. One camp in particular, these prisoners were not well fed and they were starving, thin, and discouraged. 
wondering if they would ever go home again. They wonder if they would ever see another Christmas. And the Nazi guards watched them behind the fences and their downcast faces and slumped over shoulders, scarcely even speaking to one another. They had lost hope. It was just a picture of despair. But suddenly one morning, everything changed, it seemed. They were still behind the fences. They still weren't well fed and they were still very sick. But the guards noticed that some life seemed to be breathed into them. They were happy. They were smiling. They were talking to each other again. They were gathered together in little huddles, and you could hear them hoot and holler, and the guards had no idea what's happening. But what happened is a little transistor radio had been smuggled in, and they just heard the news that Allied forces had landed in Normandy, and that they had triumphed, and they were moving steadfastly inland, and it would just be days before they were released. Liberation was happening. That's the power of news. Nothing has changed yet in Israel in our context. It was just news. And in fact, this news is going to take 700 years before it would be fulfilled. But it awakened hope among the faithful. The ones who are waiting and hoping in the consolation of Israel. The news that I get to declare to you this morning, it's, it's no longer a promise. We gather this morning because it's been realized. And so I bring you glad tidings of good joy. The best news that can lift light, bring light into your darkness. But our context that we're going to look at is a land that was in darkness. And it was a people in darkness. And unbelievable and amazing news is going to be shared with the people of Israel in that context. And it's going to be of a great deliverance far greater than Nazi Germany. It's going to be of an eternal deliverance of a great deliverer. And so the news is the meaning of Christmas. And this promised deliverer in Isaiah 9 came into the world born of a virgin to save sinners among who I am foremost, the best news for sinners. And so let's unpack the diamond of this prophecy start, and just stare at the meaning of the incarnation right in the face this morning. So come with me to Isaiah 9.1. But there will be no more gloom for who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan Galilee of Gentiles. <clears throat> so you come to Isaiah 9.1, it begins with, but, translated nevertheless. And you say, that is not how you start a thought, exactly. So it is continuing on with what's been going on in Isaiah chapter 7 through 8. And what's going on there is Israel has just this external form of religion. Their heart is far from God. They, they did all their religious rituals, they're, they're, but their lives did not want God to dwell in them. This people, God said, worship me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That, that's the land. We, we worship God with our lips, but our hearts are just gone. Could have happened for you this morning. And God has come and he's chastised them. He sought to turn their hearts back to him. And they won't. They're, they're stiff-necked and they're rebellious. They're happy with their religion. You know, the old saying, a little religion never hurt no one. It's destroying Israel. So God calls Isaiah the prophet to go and proclaim judgment to the house of Israel. And chapter 7 through 8 gets real historical. And here's the history. God has brought the house of Israel together and King David. David sins, the house is divided. We now have the northern and southern kingdom. We have Israel in the northern and Judah in the southern. And there's great enmity now going on between these two countries, nations. And so Israel forms an alliance with Syria, who is a, a power. And they're, and they're asking Syria to come and lay Judah waste. And so the king of Judah... King Ahaz, out of fear of this threat, he goes and makes an alliance with Assyria, who's just the greatest power in the world at that time. And he's going to make an alliance for Assyria to come take care of Israel. And so God has promised Judah, the king, that he would protect them. And Isaiah comes to Ahaz, the king, and says, don't do this, Ahaz. God will establish your house. Ask God for a sign of his commitment to bless you. And it's back in Isaiah 7. I'm just going to read part of it, verse 14. 
Here's the sign. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son. And she's going to call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And this promise then takes faith and trust. And, and, and Ahaz, I need something I can see and help right now. And so Ahaz goes through with his plan. And he's told Assyria, well, they will come and wipe out Israel indeed and the Syrians. And then they're going to come and they're going to wipe you out as well. Yet God, the faithful one to his covenant, his promises, will still bring about a restoration because of his promises to the fathers and his covenant. In him, Israel will be uh, restored in the nations as well. And we come to Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9, then, Israel has been chastised and they're famished. They're under great suffering. And so they curse the king and they curse God. Very much what we see going on in our land. And when you quit looking to God, they look only to the earth now in our context. And what do they see? Distress and gloom. They're crushed under a great famine. And all the psychological and physical stress that goes with such a difficult time. They're struggling. It's just hardship. Some of you, again, you don't have to work hard for it. It's what you're feeling this morning. And they're looking for help everywhere. And we just keep turning to the world and what can help us? What can fix it? Look with me in chapter 8, verse 19. When they say to you, consult the mediums and the spiritists who whisper and mutter, go to the occult. Go to all the demonic worship that we see going on all over our land. Go to them for help. Should not a people instead consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and the testimony, it's like give a cheer. Look to God and his word. If they do not speak according to this word, it's because they have no dawn. They will pass through the land hard-pressed and famished, And it will turn out that when they are hungry, they will be enraged and curse their king and their God as they face upward. And then they're going to look to the earth. And as they do, behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be driven away into darkness. Ahaz shut the temple door. And when you take God out of your land, what happens? Idolatry grows and blossoms. And it always brings darkness and despair. And I'll just ask you this morning, have your idols worked? Maybe you've come in here this morning, it's your first time even in church. Have the things you look to in this world to finally satisfy your heart, have they worked? They always end in despair. Always. I was thinking back, I think there's enough older people here. Have you ever heard of the song American Pie? I hate to even quote it. But this guy's writing a song and it's Isaiah. Everything's gone wrong. And he said, I went to the church to find assurance, and I found that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost had taken the first train to the coast. They were gone, and so I tried to kill myself, and I drove my Chevy to the levee, but the levee was dry. That is the land and heart that takes God out of it. That's what I see all around us. When you take God out of your life, you will despair. Your idols will not deliver. They will always end up in this place. And so are you looking at idols to make you happy this Christmas? I see more idolatry at Christmas than any other time is is just the the right presence, the right people around me. This is going to finally be the jolly time of the year for me. And it's just all the idolatry of what I'm looking for to finally make me happy. And they're just going to leave you dark. The pressure to be jolly will lead to darkness and despair. And I'm going to throw something out for free. Hallmark is advertising the biggest idols on earth. I said it. What solves everything in these stories? I'm telling you, it's never Jesus. It's the new boyfriend who is nicer and better. It's, it's, it's always something that is earthly. And we just drink that up. And we're disappointed when that's not our reality. Okay, I'll quit picking on Hallmark, Okay. If your wife likes it, join her and love on her and all that. So so I want you to hear this. 
Your idols are what make you sad, dark, and bleak, and despair. It's your idols. Because they'll never, they'll never work. And Isaiah is going to explain that's the whole land. You've moved away from God and looked to the idols. And I'm going to give you some good news right in the middle of it. America has removed God. Time magazine a while back declared that God is dead. And we've removed him from our minds and our hearts. And what has happened is it's a land now filled with darkness and despair. And so I want you to hear this. Our main problem is not COVID. Our main problem is not locking people up. Our main problem is not vaccinations. Our problem is that we need the light to shine in our darkness. And some of you need some light to shine this morning. And I love in, in the prophecies in Luke, he says, I'm, the, the sunrise from on high will visit us to give light, to break into our darkness. And so I pray this morning that this promise will break into your darkness. Chapter 9 is that light. This is what you're really looking for and why nothing else can really give true light. Everything that you keep looking for isn't working because this is what you've been made for. This is your greatest need. This is the gospel. Chapter 9 then is dropped into this landscape. Verse 1, nevertheless, but there's a light. There's dawn. And God now erupts into the situation. Earth, we can't fix it with our own key. So God's going to enter in. He's going to bring light from outside this world and outside of us. That is the good news of Christmas and, and Easter and all the good, good word of the work of Jesus Christ. And so what I want to do this morning is look at this text, and I want to learn the true message of Christmas. And maybe this morning you could see the light for the very first time to dispel your darkness that you have been feeling your whole life, and you just can't get out of it. This morning, I'm going to give you hope for what you're feeling. And some of you, by hard providences, are feeling darkness as children of God. And I've prayed that light would break in as you look at the picture of what God has done for us this morning. For believers, this can dispel your darkness as you look again at this gift of what God has done for us. So outline. I don't know if I sent it in or not. I think I forgot. There's no outline, is there? Oh, there, oh good. Beautiful. There's one in my heart, so I'm going to go with it. So here's our outline. You can get it on the screen. Is Isaiah 9, 1 through 7, the prophet gives us four truths to show the full meaning of Christmas. And the first truth we're going to look at is Isaiah shows the nature of Israel's distress in verses 1 through 2. But 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 there will be no more gloom for her who is in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious by the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Christmas means the world was a dark place. And that is what Isaiah is painting for us, people walking in darkness. Without Christ, we can have all of our moral agendas and do everything to make it a nice place. But at the end of the day, it's selfish, dark, lost world that cannot find its way. Proverbs says, where it's like a man in darkness. They do not know over what they stumble. And our whole world is just stumbling over things, and they, they don't know why. It's just darkness. The world's lost its way. And later in Isaiah, he's going to say, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way, and that's darkness. It's led us into more darkness. These people now are coming to right conclusions, and some of you have them this morning. The world is a dark place. Without the gift of chapter 9, again, the whole Bible's black if you take Jesus out of it. It's like a, a deep cave. You can't even see your hand. Christmas is supposed to be the most wonderful time of the year, right? Be jolly. Last Christmas, I spent saying goodbye to my dad and cried the whole way home. And yet I was filled with joy because of this word, nevertheless. Nevertheless, there's this amazing light and amazing comfort that if God did what he said he would in this promise, we have a great hope. 
I want to declare that to you this morning. I want you to notice from our text in verse 1, it's interesting. He brings in Zebulun and Naphtali, <coughs> which are, they're feeling the oppression of the alien invaders from Assyria. And, and so they are, they're making their presence felt. That's the context of this prophecy. And them, they're going to see this great light he's telling us. And I want you to see that this, this exact land, uh, if you don't mind, keep your hand in Isaiah and flip over to Matthew 4. This is too beautiful to not have all of you lay your eyes on this. It's not enough just to hear, hear me read it. This, this should take your breath away. <laughs> 700 years later, this is how you know he's God. You don't give details like this 700 years before it, and then it comes true to the T. I just want you to worship this morning at the ground of this one. Look at verse 12 of Matthew 4. Jesus enters the world. He begins his ministry. Now, when Jesus heard that John the Baptist had been taken into custody, he withdrew into to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of what? Zebulun and Naphtali. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light, and those who were sitting in the land in shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. That promise is fulfilled right there. And this bright light is coming in the world to shine into your darkness and give you salvation. My friends, Jesus is the light of the world. He came in our darkness to give us deliverance from sin and all of its slavery and all of its consequences. So whether you lived in 733 BC, at the time of this prophecy of great darkness, or if you lived in Palestine at the first century when Jesus walked the earth, or you sit here this morning at Southside Bible Church, this promise is for you. The light is coming to the world to lift our darkness from sin that has separated us from God and trying to find happiness without Him. That's the nature of Isaiah's distress. Our second point is I want you to see there's going to be an increase of joy. Hark the herald, angels sing. Verse 3, you shall multiply the nation. He just keeps talking, spread the tent, spread the pegs out. This, this gospel is going to go to the nations. You're going to multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in what? Your presence. As with the gladness of harvest, when you finally work and all that labor and you get the fruit of it, what joy. As men rejoice when they divide the booty, the spoil from war and all that they get from it. For you shall break the yoke of their burden uh, and on their staff, their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor is at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult and cloak rolled in blood will be burning and it'll be fuel for the fire. So Isaiah now starts talking to God and he's telling them what, what they will say to God after he's revealed his salvation. And God's salvation expands his people's joy. He unburdens them from their deepest distress. All that the context is, here's the remedy. All that sin has done and all that you've known of this, this is just joy in God and in his salvation of delivering you. And I just need some of you to take a deep, deep look this morning. What is your joy found in? And, and I, want, I want to say really. Not what you think it should be and not what you say. This passage demands, what is my joy found in? Or you'll be sitting in darkness just like everyone else. Before God who knows your heart and sees right into it, what are you looking for for joy? Because as a minister, what I minister most often is people trying to find joy in something other than God. And so I just, this morning, I want to pull that, your eyes off the world looking to it for your, your, your hope. And that's why you're sad. And that's why our idols don't help and they don't, Deliver, and we lift up Christ. The world brings darkness, but this light, this child that was born to give eternal life, brings salvation, and this promise was answered. 
too many times my joy is still linked to the things of earth. And it always ends in sorrow and darkness. That's what idols do. There's something that has to change or be acquired for me to have joy. And guess what? You'll never find it then. If joy is around the corner, a guy smiling who found his son dead doesn't make any sense to me. And it's what we're looking at this morning. I can do this. I'm going to give you one little sweet note. He says, as, as like the battle of Midian. I'm like, why, why, what do you mean the battle of Midian? Well, what happened at the battle of Midian? Well, there was a great army ready to destroy Israel. And they were so outnumbered, there was no way to win. And do you remember what God did? Who was the leader? Gideon. And he tells Gideon, you know, who to send home and who to have leave. And he just winnows down the army. You're like, that's not how you win battles. <laughs> send them all home. Except for 300 people. And now 300 people are going to go in and have this miraculous defeat of their enemies by this small, humble number. Much like the greatest defeat in the history of the universe, the devil, sin, and death, by a humble babe born into a manger to give us the victory over sin. Third point. There's a promised Messiah in verse 6. For a child will be born to us and a son will be given to us. <laughs> He's the reason for joy. I'm telling you, there's no other place to find joy. He's the reason. And a child is going to be born, a son will be given. And so I love that a child will be born into this world and he would come into the world like any other human. He's going to be conceived in a mother's womb. He's going to be birthed. He's going to be subject to our limitations as humanity. He's going to grow in wisdom and stature. He's going to grow thirsty and tired and hungry. He's going to weep and sleep. He's going to be fully man. The promised Messiah. But then he says a son will be given to us. And that preaches his pre-existence. And so this one from eternity past, his goings forth are from long ago. And this is God. And he existed as God for all of eternity. We'll see that on Christmas Eve. And so he this preaches his preexistence. His life preceded the coming into the world. I want you to hear that. He was given to us. There will never be a greater gift that could ever be given. God gave his son to this dark world as fully human and fully God. This prophecy in the darkness, a ruler is going to be born to you, and now you're going to have a ruler who's going to govern for your best interests. Think about what they're going through. All the wicked kings that you see that Israel had and rose up. I mean, at this point, Israel, their king, has shut the door to the temple, and they're offering up their children on the altar, burning them to Molech as worship to this false idol. That's not what kings are to do. And we're going to have a ruler with the best heart who's going to rule his kingdom for the well-being of his people. What a promise to people who are being ruled by by uh, bad leaders. There's hope. One with perfect wisdom and justice and love and sovereignty, we've been brought into that kingdom. And the government will rest on his shoulders. He'll have absolute sovereignty, all authority in heaven and on earth. The greater son of David, the one who will rule over all providence, the heart of every king is in his hand, and he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Is the unrivaled, sovereign, supreme king over all creation who's going to be born in that manger. The government will rest on his shoulders. Human history and the nations all on him. He'll bring all of history to its climactic end. He has the ultimate throne and everyone, every other comes under. That's a pretty big promise. <laughs> and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Ahaz is crafty, deceitful, shrewd. He's not godly. He's not wise. He doesn't care for the people. This ruler will be wise. He's going to have supernatural wisdom. He's going to have what we call omniscience, perfect knowledge of being God. And he's going to be a wonderful counselor. He's one who will always know what's best and what we need and how to get his help. Solomon's counsel and wisdom is a dim picture to this one who's going to be born in the world. 
And so the one with the government upon his shoulders will have perfect wisdom to rule and run his kingdom. He knows what is best for every situation. He has complete control with the wisdom to know how to bring the future about perfectly according to God's plan for God's glory. What wisdom? Rest in it. This is who was given to us. We can have counsel as we journey this life to our true home. We have the mind of Christ and his word and his spirit to guide us. What a blessing of what he's promising through Isaiah here. Third, his name's going to be Mighty God. The babe that will be born to us will be Emmanuel, Mighty God. And his name will be God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And Ahaz, there's going to be a sign and his name will be Emmanuel, the one born from a virgin. God is with us. And so guys, a child will be given to us, but he'll be like no other one that was ever born into this world. He's going to be mighty God. And here's the glory of one who's born and he's mighty God. And that's what was in that womb of Mary was Almighty God in humanity so that he could have a body that could be sacrificed on a cross to take away our transgressions. Who comes up with plans like this? And this one's messed people up a little bit, but it's just beautiful. He'll be called eternal father. The rulers were to be, to the nations, they were to be fathers, spiritual fathers even. And they were to rule over the people in this way. This one who's promised will be an eternal father, He'll care for the well-being of his flock like a good shepherd. He'll rule in a fatherly way in every sense of the word. He'll care for us. Let that grip you. This is going to be the eternal father. And in the, just one other thought, in the literal he, Hebrew, it's the father of eternity. And so he could be even pointing to Micah 5 too. His going forth are from long ago. And so the, his birth is eternity stepping into time. There's an eternality to this child who would be born. And in 1 John, he says, we, we beheld him and he is, there's a definite article, the eternal life. This one born will give us the eternal life to live forever. And so this one who's going to be born is the one over eternity. Because he's over eternity, he can give you life with him forever. What baby can do that? My favorite is Prince of Peace a wonderful counselor, an eternal God who can bring all this to pass, an eternal father with an eternal perspective, and follow the path his counsel lays out. He gives us to peace. He brings shalom. He brings well-being and blessing and wholeness. Calmness is the absence of fear. He takes away fear, and he can make us whole and his blessings, and so many of you drink this up on a daily basis. He's brought peace with God, and peace in my own heart, and peace with others. And I just, he's, he's the prince of peace. My peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Wow. How can anyone live a moment on this earth without the peace of Christ? The fear of living in a world filled with chaos and dysfunction and danger and all that we see going on in our land. The Prince of Peace is going to be born into it. And so do you need him to whisper into your troubled heart this morning, just shh, and let all the waves stop of everything that you're facing. The Prince of Peace has brought about, you're, you're safe. You're right with God, you're his child, you're adopted, he's overseeing your life. Just There's so many things swirling, just let the Prince of Peace go shh, just like those waves on that boat and let it calm this morning. That's who was born in the world. The one who would bring peace to our hearts and peace with God. Everything the world's looking for is right here. They're all looking for a good ruler. Have we found it? <laughs> I, I don't think we've found one my whole life. We're looking for a good ruler. We're always looking for counsel and help. We're looking for power to change things. And everybody wants eternity. And everyone I've ever met, especially this time of the year, is looking for peace. And everything that the world's groping and looking for in this world to fill, 
God says, I'm going to send my son into the world, and he's going to fulfill all those. That's what you've been looking for your whole life. That's why you're distressed and in anguish and in darkness. What was born in Bethlehem's manger is the answer to all of our problems. And our last point, 4a, the zeal of the Lord will accomplish this in verse 7. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So the reason I just smile this morning is because of God. He says, I'll do this. And there's another promise that I'm going to come back into the world and establish the kingdom forever. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish it. God will see to it. That's why we saw in Matthew 4 it got fulfilled is God will accomplish what he decrees. 700 years later, true to promise, God did it. His son was born in a manger, was born with the virgin's womb. The light of the world was born into a fallen, dark world. Those who walked in darkness, they groped for God, but they couldn't find him. Who could not find deliverance with any of our alliances, any of our idols? We couldn't fix it. There's no way to solve it. And maybe this morning you're looking for alliances to find peace, like the law. I'm just a good moral person. I'm conservative. I go to church and I try to be the best person I can possibly be. You're hiding from God. That isn't going to fix your problem. Maybe it's uh, that you're looking in this world. You're looking for the world to deliver you and give you the happiness that you've always wanted. You're looking for it in a guy or a girl. You're looking for it in indulgence. You're looking for it in security. There's all these ways to look for it. In stepped a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. He said, his name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sin. And he was born in this world to die and to go up and bear the wrath of God for our sins. There is no other way to get the justice and wrath of God off you. No morality, no striving, trying to change your nature. Nothing else can fix it but God sending his son into this world to come and redeem it. And so in closing, twice in our passage, it says, for unto us, for unto us. And the question is, who's the us? And the us is those who will believe in the son of God, that he came and he made sacrifice to atone for my sin, to remove it, to clear it out, to give it payment so that I could be forgiven and adopted into the family of God. And so not everyone gets this promise. And so I'm inviting you, as Jesus says, come to me. I'll give you rest for your soul. I came into the world not to condemn it, but to save it. And I want to save your soul. And so there, between his two comings, there's an opportunity to come to this Christ who was born in this world, fully God and fully man, to save your soul. So I pray, look away from yourself and believe in Jesus Christ by faith. Look to him and repent from looking to this world and your idols and all these things to fill your heart and rescue you and turn from it and turn to Jesus Christ. Here am I, Christ, send me. And so I pray that everyone in this room is called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. What a promise. Father, I just can't thank you enough. There's so much gloom and darkness like I've never seen. And I've got the message of the light that came into this world and we're to go shine it. We're to be a city set on a hill. God, not to cover it up, we're to go and tell the world that the one who created it entered it to save it. There's a savior. And all these other false saviors will not work. They don't work. Oh, come to Christ. God, let us, let us labor in joy to proclaim this light and this truth. For we have the remedy for every soul that's in darkness. Let us love them. Let us enter in and show them the light, to tell them of it, to care like this great Savior Christ who is called the friend of sinners. God, I want that nickname. 
I want to be the friend of sinners who tells them about a great Savior who entered this world. So God, this season more than ever, awaken everyone in this room with the opportunity where people feel more darkness than at any time of the year because they're supposed to be jolly and happy and they're not. And so God, let us enter in. Let us, let us come and tell of truth and hope and light. Use us. Lord, you've just shown light into our hearts and we love others. We feel compelled. We're, we're debtors to all men, Jew and Gentile, to tell them of this gospel that we're not ashamed of, that Jesus Christ, in him, believing in him, we receive the righteousness of God. Lord, I pray, open up frozen mouths, cold hearts. Lord, let us be faithful ones to declare the glories and the light that entered this world. And I pray for anyone who's a believer in this room that just has been struggling with darkness from hard providences and things that have been beating up on them, please let this light just shine in dispel darkness that they're feeling this morning. This is the remedy. This is the cure. Don't let them look for a different circumstance or something else to cure it. Let their eyes just look squarely this morning at Jesus. And Lord, for anyone who came in here that just lives in darkness, that they're still trying to look to this world, that even coming here this morning was a, another looking to the world, maybe a little religion could help me. In the same way it couldn't help Israel, God, let them look away from that and let them see what they need is not church, not morality, but they need Jesus Christ. Give them eyes to see this morning and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his precious name that we do pray. Amen.